One time in the very beginning when I was by myself, this bureaucrat came up to me and he said, um, what you're trying to do with turning around the JCPOA policy and um, your support for Israel, this building will stop you every step of the way and you will not find more resistance to any other policy that your administration tries to do but the policies related to Israel. Amanda Milius, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. So Amanda, you are the director of the documentary film, The Plot Against the President, which uh, in the film you prove that despite Hollywood's woke virtue signaling and one failed uh, woke movie after the next, you have proven that conservative films are lucrative. And I want to talk about that. But beyond that, I've watched the film three times now myself. And what I found was the information that came out of it was shocking. Information about our intelligence agencies, about people like Adam Schiff seeming to willfully um, be deceiving the American people. And, and what John Solomon, who you interview in the film, uh, mentioned that it seemed like there was something almost like an information uh, operation being conducted against the American people. Wanted to ask you about that. Is that the takeaway from the film? Uh, definitely. I mean, for me, the reason that I keep, uh, obviously, I return to the movie in most interviews because it's the biggest thing that I've done. It was a really big success. It was the number one documentary on Amazon, I think, still to this day. Um, but also because what's really important and really relevant about that movie that stays relevant is that it's the blueprint. Okay, so it's the blueprint for how they do information operations on the American people on a grand scale. When we made that movie, we made it uh, in the early part of 2020. Nobody had any idea that um, some of the things that have happened since that have been disproven would have happened. I mean, we've seen many operations. We've seen giant mass scale info operations on the public, on the global public, on the American public since then. And the blueprint, I always point them back to Plot Against the President because it analyzes, the whole point of it was to take apart how they do these info ops and how they convince an entire portion of the United States that something that is not true is true, that has to be studied. I mean, even for on a national security level, it has to be studied because basically our national security apparatus has turned against the state. And so for our audience who may not have watched it yet, but of course everyone must watch The Plot Against the President, you need to see this film, is that it's really, the, the story is about uh, the Russiagate hoax and uh, the accusations against President Trump that he was somehow colluding with the Russians. And so what we find again was that every kind of apparatus of the state was being used against uh, the president to, to basically try to, you know, kind of turn a, an election where the people of America voted in a United States president and they basically were trying to undo an election. And there was so much that, that, uh, that you covered in the film was the role of General Flynn. Now, what I found fascinating about how it seemed like whoever the forces were behind this came after General Flynn within days of the Trump administration coming into office was the fact that General Flynn had um, been on record saying that he was going to be exposing the Iran deal, that he was against the United States going into the JCPOA 2015 Iran deal. What's your take on that? For a 90 minute documentary, there's a fairly good chunk of time that we talk about the JCPOA, the construction of the JCPOA, who was involved, why, and uh, the people who were opposed to it. Because this is one of the Obama administration's um, cornerstone pieces of their policy. And also a very important piece of the policy that our administration, the Trump administration, was 180 degrees against. Um, so the, there's, there's going to be, that's going to be a pressure point no matter what. Um, General Flynn being a, um, a representative of someone who saw 
the flawed nature of that deal. And um, again, as the president's national security advisor was the, uh, not for that reason alone, but in addition was a natural target uh, for for the the bad guys, if you will, to try to slow him down um, and slow down the presidency. Um, and and quickly, I'll I'll speak to what you said when you when you began, which I've actually been thinking about more and more recently. Which is, we constantly hear this talk these days about um, our democracy and how um, the 2020 election uh, was such a threat to our democracy because it was challenged and uh, and all of this. And without getting into anything about 2020, what was 2016 if not? A, and the entire Russiagate hoax, but an internal uh, rejection of the 2016 election. The difference is the 2020 election was challenged from the people, from the outside. The 2016 election was challenged from the bureaucrats and the IC and the security st the state and people with a lot more power. So that doesn't get considered, you know, the 2016 Russia hoax uh, and beyond doesn't get considered uh, an insurrection. Exactly. And Amanda, you and I know each other from our time together in the State Department. When I was there, I will never forget the kind of tense environment where hanging over our heads the entire time was the Democrats' attempt at impeaching our president. And you and I were both presidential appointees, and so we were working in in an environment where there were people who were constantly trying to undermine the work that we were doing. And again, this Russia collusion hoax was kind of hanging over our heads the entire time. What was your sense of, of how the operation works in the State Department? Well, I, I mean, yes, of course, we remember uh, being political appointees, you're either looked at sideways or with suspicion, like, oh, well, if he's, taking orders from Putin, what about these people? Especially if you're a political appointee who's particularly loyal to the president and to the mission and to the outlined um, goals that the administration wanted to achieve. I think a lot of those goals and a lot of um, hamstringing was done. The president was hamstrung by these endless investigations as anyone would be. I mean, can you imagine in your daily life having these kinds of accusations of this sort of nature thrown against you? Uh, in any kind of job, let alone the most important job in the United States. I mean, it's amazing that we got through it, but that was the point, and um, we dealt with that. And I mean, you'd think something, when I remember when you came in the office, I was so happy to have somebody who was going to be, um, you know, a comrade and a, uh, um, a fellow traveler, especially on the issue of the Middle East and Israel. But I remember when I first started, when I was there for a year and a half practically by myself with very few people, and you finally came in, Elon came in, real wor real warriors for uh, our issues in the Middle East and our foreign policy and whatnot, and I was so happy. Um, and anyway, so this, this one time in the very beginning when I was by myself, this bureaucrat came up to me and he said, um, what you're trying to do with turning around the JCPOA policy and um, your support for Israel, this building will stop you every step of the way and you will not find more resistance to any other policy that your administration tries to do but the policies related to Israel. And I, I think that people don't understand that. And this is something that I think matters a lot. What you're talking about is um, really serious. How much the bureaucracy, our federal agencies, mm -hmm. uh, try to undermine the Trump administration's policy priorities. And, uh, and like you said, when I was in the anti-Semitism office, I felt it every single day that the deep state, uh, to use that language, was really fighting against us and not, not really um, wanting us to achieve any success in the Which work that we were crazy. doing. Just listen to yourself say that. I was working in the anti-Semitism office and they were still throwing a fit and trying to stop everything you were doing. What does that mean? Like, take that apart. What does that mean? It well, means precisely what it sounds like it means, which is that even in the anti-Semitism department, they want to slow it down. They don't want you to be able to achieve what, what you're trying to achieve. I mean, 
that only means one thing. Yeah, it's crazy stuff, and that's why I was very excited to have you on, because I was hoping that you would share with our audience some of that experience. Um, Amanda, I want to I wanna take you to one other, um, one other item about your time in the State Department, which was you were instrumental in the, uh, in the events around the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. So tell us a bit about that. Um, well, it happened, if you recall, um, between the handover from Tillerson to Pompeo. One of the first times I knew that we were going we to have an issue with State Department is under Tillerson, there was um, questions about, well, aren't we going to, it was one of the first top 10 issues, we're going to open the embassy in Jerusalem. And the Tillerson crowd uh, and, his, she, and his main staff, his, his main office, you know, his main senior advisors, everyone agreed that we would not be able to do this within eight years. It would have to take at least eight years. There would have to be many discussions before such a thing could happen and blah, blah, blah. And um, I, I think it was very clear that the White House did not agree. And I think it was very clear that the, the very brave men who led this issue, especially Ambassador Friedman, um, Jared Kushner, um, um, everyone that was involved in the issue um, knew that they that this was an important symbolic and re and and and, and, a, and a, a reaffirming of reality that needed to happen. So um, you know, I was I was only uh, participating in so much as I did foreign comms, right? I did foreign communications, and this was obviously very much in my portfolio, and it was very important that we explained why we were doing this. This is a reaffirming of reality. This is not a change from reality. This is a affirming of reality. It was a pleasure to go. It was the most exciting. Um, I mean, the excitement in the entire country could be felt. When we landed, there were, there were pictures of President Trump everywhere, American flags everywhere, people in the streets with signs, we love you, Trump, like just amazing, amazing experience. Um, it was so cool. And we, I got to see the, the very first dedicated plaque um, on the walls of the embassy. I mean, I'll never forget it. How many times do you get to be in your life uh, at, at an opening of an embassy of that kind of historical, um, you know, significance. It'll never happen again. It's one of the times where I say it's all worth it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, it, I had a lot of those moments in the administration where I, I felt like pinching myself, you know, and I, it sounds like it was one of those moments for you. And absolutely, it was the, it was the making of history. Amanda, I'd love to talk a little bit about you, uh, your personal story. So you grew up in L.A., the daughter of a legendary Hollywood director. Your dad's film credits include Apocalypse Now, Conan the, Bra the Barbarian, Dirty Harry. I mean, these are just legendary movies that, that all of us are so familiar with. Oh, and in researching uh, our interview today, I found out that your father, I think, was... Um, was the inspiration for for Walter, the character Walter, yeah. in The Big Lebowski. Walter Sobchak, yes. <laughs> Weirdly is actually the most accurate uh, representation of him my brothers and I have ever seen. Like We didn't know that that was, no one told us that that was actually based on him. But as we grew up, we were fond of the movie and we were like, this is so weird. This that guy is just like dad. I mean, how do you invent a character like that? Like, it's like, I don't even know how that's possible. Then my brother figured it out. So now it has this whole new meeting and then we love it because it's, uh, I mean, that's the kind, it's so accurate. So the character is this cult, cult favorite and I think the, the yeah. favorite line that everybody has is show him her f***ing job. Well, I love it too because you know what? I have such a thing where so many times online, you know, I gather a eclectic uh, collection of friends uh, and followers online just because I don't know, I don't know how or why, Really, I just make movies, but I just use it as sort of a mental diary to kind of like spout things that I think, you know, now that I have no reason not to. Because a lot of them will come back and they'll be like, oh, she's an Oshki, la la la. They'll just say, show her fing Shabbos. Like, I mean, that's just what I do. It's like, you know, who do they think? Like, I'm like Walter Sobchak's daughter. Like, of course I'm Jewish. Like, what do they want? Like, it's hilarious. I love it. And I, and I think <laughs> anyone who knows you has to love you, Amanda. But <laughs> and it's the truth. It's the truth. But so, so tell us a bit, you know, what was that growing up like? Um, well, you know, it was weird. It was, I didn't really discover the 
heritage my family had in the United States uh, until um, we uncovered a lot of stuff at my grandmother's estate. When I went to New York, um, I became more interested in A, our family history, and B, practicing Judaism, finding my place in it. Um, it was just not something that we did as much as kids. A, I mean, my family was, it's Hollywood. It's very all over the place. My dad got married again. My mom, you know, was, I, I mean, everybody's, the family tree in Hollywood looks crazy. It's like, it's, there's everyone's married 10 different times. Like, it's like, it's a whole, it's not, it's not a normal, you know, family situation. So I really got more into it. Uh, obviously my ex-fiance was, uh, 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 had lived in Israel half his life. I'm really fond of Israel and, and certainly that sort of, type of living with Judaism, I think is very appealing to me, uh, more so than the sort of stereotypical American style, I guess. Um, I love how everyone goes to the army there. I love the IDF. I think it's so cool. But I mean, the amazing thing about Israel is that Israel knows at any moment that their very existence is threatened, whereas in the United States, we have the luxury of having all these absurdities in our military, like pregnant flight suits and, uh, 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 taxpayer-funded transgender surgeries and all of this. It, it is a, it's a fascinating country, and I also think this um, the the Jew, the Israeli Jew that you're describing, mm -hmm. is um, rugged. Yes. Um, militarily adept. It's and not I, Woody Allen. It's not Woody Allen, exactly. And it's, I find this mm -hmm. archetype a little more appealing. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you all the way, Amanda. And so, Amanda, I want to talk a little bit also about how you wind up in the State Department. So if I know the story correctly, you wind up working on the Trump campaign. Can you tell us what happened there and what that experience was like? Um, yeah, I just basically, I was working in film. I did my first uh, short. It was in a lot of festivals, so I was traveling a lot. So I was sort of not doing a consistent job. So I had time on my hands, but I couldn't talk about politics and it was driving me nuts because it's all I want to talk about. I mean, I'd been obsessed with politics since I was like, you know, for years, but in LA, I had to play dumb and just act like I wasn't following current events or whatever. And I, I just suddenly had this identity crisis and just jumped in my car and ran to the desert like one does when you're Jewish. <laughs> you had to go, you wanted to wander back, into, wander the, back, into, back the into the desert. <laughs> and I went to uh, Las Vegas because Nevada is the uh, closest swing state and I actually wanted to work for the Trump campaign as a volunteer in any way that I could because I was tired. There were little pockets in Los Angeles of people talking about politics and you would get together at some secret spot and you would finally be able to admit you were a Republican and talk about politics. But nothing was getting done. So I just showed up and I said, put me to work. And it, was, it wasn't about, and it was just normal people like moms and dads taking their one day off to go knock doors for the president in 110 degree heat in Las Vegas. And I met the most amazing people and they were, all, it was just, it was the happiest I've ever been because it was about something bigger than us. And, and we had something in common and we were all just happy to know each other. And, um, you know, it was just a really pure time. And it wasn't, it was just great. So I worked as hard as I could. And eventually I was offered a job uh, in the administration when we win. And I said, but that's crazy. No one would ever let me work in government. That's nuts. I, you know, I, uh, I did not lead my life in such a way that I thought I would ever work in government. Um, and they were like, no, it's, that's the point. We want different people. We want new people. We want new people and new ideas. And so I was like, all right, well, send me to the place where you've got the toughest time because I don't mind. I don't want to be liked by everybody. I don't mind not being liked by everybody. I kind of like it just throw me in the hard spot. And I suppose that was State Department. You know, one other additional factor that made the Trump administration unique was that they brought in a lot of outsiders and there were a yeah. lot of people who were not from the think tank, DC policy world. And, Thank God. Uh, yeah, and I there were still too many though. <laughs> but it did bring, I think, a lot of um, fresh ideas into the administration that otherwise just never seemed to get in in Washington. And so speaking of fresh ideas, Amanda, Tell us what you're working on next. Plot Against the President, I think, is one of the most important films that's come out in our generation. What are you doing next? 
Um, well, we are finishing up, you know, Plot Against the President will be available internationally soon, um, which is really exciting because we have fans in uh, every country you can think of. The next handful of projects, you know, usually you don't announce, I mean, sometimes you announce the optioning of material, it just doesn't get as much press. For whatever reason, we, you know, the, the amount of press we got for optioning the McAfee book, which is called No, Dam no Domain by Mark uh, Eglinton, Eglinton um, which is amazing because it is John McAfee's final interviews on tape with someone he agreed with. Like McAfee has had many uh, docs. I'm very fond of guys like him. Some people say they're like, well, weird. Why would you go from making sort of like a Devin Nunes, sort of Donald Trump movie to John McAfee? And I actually see it very clearly. I mean, A, they both ran for president in 2016. <laughs> But, um, but also, these are people who are not afraid to live life on their own terms and who don't follow the crowd. And that's really what I care about. Those are the kind of characters I want to make movies about. Um, we're also working with Lee Smith again, who wrote Plot Against the President, um, whose book is still out. I think it's still a bestseller. And his other book, The Permanent Coup, is, is phenomenal as well. But he wrote a viral article called The 30 Tyrants about the slow sell-off of the United States to China. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we have essentially optioned the book that he is currently writing about that topic. Um, and so that will be in development alongside it because we want to do something about China, but we want to do something that has to do with how did this happen? Because as we both know in State Department, we walk in and one of the things one of political say to each other is, how did this happen? This has been going on for 50 years and all of a sudden China is in the position that it's in. This didn't happen by, by accident. Who was watching the shop? It wasn't us. We just got there. It wasn't me. I was in film school. Exactly so right. I, I want to know what happened from Kissinger on. So, um, so this is a very interesting documentary. We're going to, uh, you know, and certainly obviously uh, weave in a lot of what's gone on recently with China, with Wuhan, with everything. There's a lot, there's, there's just so much we can do. It's just going to be, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see what happens. But um, yeah, that's, that's the future. It's going to be work, work, work. Well, Amanda, I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate your joining me on Global Perspectives. And we will be waiting for every new film of yours that's coming <laughs> out. Cannot wait to see them. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you so much. <laughs>